All right, this is our fourth really big class. I can't believe it's already been four weeks of this. Um, and I don't see any reason to stop ever. Um, maybe slow down, but not stop. Um, welcome to those of you who are back. I can see some friends from previous weeks here. Alyssa, thank you for coming again. Brendan, Rob, Louisa from my class at RNCM. Thank you for being here. And I am so excited about today. I just can't even, I can't even tell you how excited I am about today. And it's for a bunch of reasons. One is that this is really working and we're having a great time and it's an escape from, from a lot of what we are dealing with day to day. Um, in addition to being inspiring and, and, and interesting and educational, but tonight or today, whatever it is morning for some of you, um, <laughs> is really what I intended to happen with this class because we have violinists from all over the world. Pasha's in Texas. Leslie, one of our performers today is in Canada. We have three um, wonderful violinists in the UK from different schools, different teachers, different parts of the, of the country. And um, I'm sure that there are people on YouTube watching that I don't even know, know where they are because I can't see, but it's just, really what I had in mind when when I thought we could make this happen with our sort of new worldwide um, network of, of musicians. The other thing I'm really thrilled about today is that we have people from a real variety of um, of experience levels. So we have two of our performers today are in the middle of their graduate degrees and are poised to or have already entered the professional world. Um, we have uh, one player who is sort of ready to, to really get serious about their musical studies and are considering their offers for, for university. And then we have a violinist who has only played for three years, which is absolutely amazing. And I'm so excited that we get to share this experience with each other. The other thing I'm really happy about today is that we have some absolutely masterpieces of the of the repertoire being played. Sibelius Violin Concerto, Saint-Saëns Violin Concerto, a Paganini Caprice, and the Chartus that I think we all um, remember playing and, and if we haven't played it yet, look forward to playing. These are pieces of the repertoire that are just, they're just vital. They're, they're, they're our bread and butter of the repertoire so that we get to do this together is also really cool. And I just wanted to put an idea out there sort of at the beginning of the class today, which is something that I like to remember every time I'm in front of an audience, if that ever happens again. Um, and that is that there's someone out there who has never heard the piece of music that you're going to play. And you are giving them their first taste of that piece of music. And that's one of the things I remember from violin class that I loved so much was hearing these pieces of music for the first time. I'll never forget the first time I heard his eyes ballad in a violin class. I thought it was the most incredible thing I had ever heard. I couldn't imagine being able to play it and to hear it in person was just really special. So that's something to remember when you're performing is that you're giving someone that first experience. And that's a real privilege that we have as musicians and players. So that's just sort of a something I've been thinking about today and wanted to share. Um, before we get to the performances, I wanted to tell you a bit about my friend Pasha Saburi. So I met Pasha when he was about, we think he it was when he was 13. And he I was at a, a chamber music festival in Las Vegas. Uh, with my string quartet and it was a very funny thing because the chamber music itself was pretty normal we went to a university we went to classrooms we we played scales together we had lessons we had um chamber music coachings concerts all of that and then at the end of the day um the faculty went back to the las vegas strip where we were housed at one of the casinos and it was this very strange juxtaposition of of worlds that I'll never forget. And we had the greatest time there. But Pasha was one of the, the students at this festival. And I think, I'm trying to remember, you can correct me if I'm wrong. I think the first time I heard you play, you weren't enrolled in the festival. Your parents brought you 
to play for us. Is that right? Okay. And so he came in and he was tiny, really small. And he played um, Mozart G major, first movement. And I was just astonished by this boy and his playing. And I remember saying to my colleagues, he's like a little Perlman. I don't know if I ever told you that, Pasha, that something about the joy that you brought to the playing the violin and playing that piece reminded me of, of, of Perlman. And you had this perfect setup to all your bow hand was just perfect. And I thought, wow, what a talent. I can't wait to see what this guy does. And then I think, I don't know if it was the next summer or maybe a couple of years later, you came as a student to the festival and mm -hmm. you brought all of that with you and, and I got to know you then and you had a warmth and engaging uh, musical personality that was also your your uh, social personality and I remember telling you kind of sternly um, that that going to conservatory wasn't about hanging out in the lounge and talking to your friends um, <laughs> but I you also were the first person to ever tell me that by the way <laughs> you you sat me down and you 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 told me what I should be doing and and how I should make the best use of my time. It was actually the, probably the most important conversation that I will that I remember going to school because nobody had ever just sat me down and and told me that you know these are the years where you really get to grow the most. So don't take them for advantage and get in that practice room. You were serious. Well, it it worked because <laughs> your playing shows it and also your your what posh has done uh in sort of in a business sense he's built an incredible studio you're in austin right austin mm -hmm. texas um he has a great studio of young violinists he's started a music festival he's written a book and he's brought all of this warmth and and um charisma to these things as well so I'm just absolutely thrilled that you're here today, Pasha, and I can't wait to hear what you have to say to these young players. No pressure, y'all. No. <laughs> uh. um, that's my intro, and I think we should get to the music. So we're doing the usual. We're going to share videos to avoid any kind of weird internet glitches, hopefully. And um, our first performer is Ollie, who's going to play Chartis. Ollie, can you tell us how long you've been working on this piece? I forgot to ask you. Um, two or three weeks. Two or oh. three weeks. And he's played the violin for three years. So here we go um, with Ollie's video. <laughs>
just expecting the crowd to go wild, like, Ollie, 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 Ollie. <laughs> Ollie, that's so good. And, you know, I think it's even more impressive that you've been working on it for such a short amount of time and that you can play through it. That's quite a feat. And so I think that's really wonderful. So congratulations to you on that. Um, one of the other things that I love is I love that I can tell that you love to play the violin. I love that because, you know, we can work on, you know, all of the things to, you know, make ourselves sound like these beautiful musicians and this and that and the next, but being able to see somebody really love what they're doing is a whole nother thing. And I think by looking at you when you perform, I can tell that you really love to play the violin, which is awesome. Am I wrong? No. No, okay. <laughs> Good, okay. I wanna talk about a couple things. Um, they're just gonna be basic concepts, but I'm, I'm gonna see what you think about them. Here's a question for you. Can you tell me what you think the three most basic things we need to have to be a musician? So what, what three skills do we need to incorporate into our playing to be a great musician? Um, creativity. Creativity, okay. Um, do you mean like techniques? Or? Yeah. Um, techniques or concepts. Like, I, I love, I love your word creativity. I'll, I'll get you to something else as well through that, but any other thoughts? Passion. Fantastic. Okay. Um, uh. I can't really think of anything else. That's okay. I mean, creativity and passion are pretty freaking awesome. So we can we can settle with those two for now. Um, I kind of break it down into three very basic qualities that I feel like we need in the very beginning to play the violin well. Okay. So one of the first things that I think, and I'll address each one of them, and then we'll go back and we'll try and put them all together. Okay. So the very first thing that I think that we need is we need a beautiful sound consistently and constantly, okay? Now, keep in mind all of the things that I'm gonna be telling you sound super basic and like they would be no problem to kind of do, but for some strange reason, here I am struggling in my older age to be able to do all three simultaneously. <laughs> so, Keep in mind that it's a process, right? And, and we're continuously working through that process and we're, we're constantly striving to refine these three things to the best of our ability over time. So, right, it's all about the journey, right? It's not where we are right now, it's about where we're going, okay? So, how do we create a beautiful sound? Well, not having your bow over the fingerboard. You need okay, so that's kind of known as like the contact point, right? Like where the bow hits the string? Yes. Okay, excellent. What else? You need to be like, if you're playing a long note, you can't have the bow going like... You need to like keep the bow on the string. Okay. So good, you're, you're basically essentially saying that you need like good traction between the bow and the string, right? Okay. Um, 
Anything else? Uh, and it's okay if you don't know. You can just say, I don't know. Yeah. Okay. This is funny because you know, this is kind of bringing me back. It's like bringing me back to my first lesson with Cecily because I felt like she asked me questions and I knew none of the answers. <laughs> But it's good because, you know, it gets us thinking. And of course, obviously, you know, we're in a setting right now where it's teacher student, but the goal eventually is for you to be able to analyze your own playing so that you can grow independently and in the way that you feel is the best for your form of musical expression, right? So that's eventually the end goal, right? You don't want to rely on somebody information for the rest of your life. You want to be able to critically think on your own to be able to process that information. So here's the three things. I mean, I think the three things for beautiful sound is like you were talking about the contact point is important, right? The speed of the bow is very important and the weight, how much weight you have in the bow is very important. Now, there's one thing I want to talk to you about and it's kind of a physics question. So let's see if you can answer it. Why do violin teachers tell you to keep your instrument up? Um, and keep in mind the answer is to not torture you on a daily basis. I don't really know. I That's okay. It's great. So it's it's a physics thing, right? So the thing is my violin is angled downward, right? Then my bow, gravity will take my bow this way, right? So it's actually quite difficult for me to be able to keep a consistent contact point towards the bridge. I have to work much harder for that to happen, right? So that's why you constantly hear teachers saying, oh, keep your violin up, right? Can you keep your, can you keep your instrument up? Can you keep your instrument up? So that's the first thing I with you. So can you stand up for me? I'm also going to stand up and move my camera. Okay. Can you go towards the side and can you? Yes. Now, here's the thing that I don't want you to do. I don't want you to feel like you're keeping your violin up so much that you're arching your because that will eventually become super painful, right? So the goal is to stand up nice and tall and to feel this is obviously really hard to do, but I'm going to try and explain it. It's to feel like there's a string on top of your head and somebody's pulling that string up, right? You can stand nice and tall with the instrument. No problem. Good. That looks very good. Okay. Now, can we try something? It's going to be super basic. For this beautiful sound, I'm sure you practice scales, right? often do you practice scales? Yes. Do you practice every day? Scales every day? Yes. Yes. Okay, good. Can we do um, just two notes? I want you to play an open G and I want you to use the full bow and then I want you to first finger A and I want you to use a full bow. Can you do that? Okay, good. I want you to try it one more time. And I want you to see if you can keep this right shoulder down. So here's the thing. My students do this a lot. So I'll tell them to get their arm up on the G string. And you did that beautifully. Your arm was up. But the problem is your shoulder was also up. So the goal is to keep your arm up, but to lower your shoulder, right? So you keep your shoulder independently move. You see that? Yes. Okay, beautiful. And then on the up bow, what I want you to pay attention to, when you're going down, you're doing great. But when you go up, what's happening is your arm dips. And then as you go up, you go up again. 
can you try and keep the plane of your arm the same all the way through? So don't let it dip and don't let it go up. Ollie, that's a beautiful sound. How does that feel? Totally uncomfortable? Not really. Not really? Fantastic. Great. Okay, so I want you to pay attention to this when you're practicing scales, right? Because this is a super important thing for you to constantly be refining because your sound is like your identity. And the three things that I gave you, you know, talking about the sound and then talking about intent. Oh, I haven't talked about the other stuff, have I? <laughs> okay, so here's the next thing that we're going to do. Intonation. Let's talk about intonation. When you do the very opening and you shift to the A, can you tell me what position that is? Um, is it six? It is. Fantastic. Now, here's the thing. You did really well with that. Did you know sixth right off the bat? No. Okay. So here's the thing. It's kind of like, you know, I'm sure this has happened with your parents. Like sometimes they'll be driving somewhere and they'll get lost and they refuse to ask for directions. So they just kind of keep going around where they need to be, but they never quite get there. And then finally they give up and they ask directions and then they arrive at the destination. <laughs> this is the thing about shifting and about, you know, intonation in general, especially when you're going into different positions. You have to be aware of where you're going from and where you're going to and the distance between, right? So if you're in sixth position, what is your first finger on? What note? on a G. Are you sure? Um, no. <laughs> so, it's totally fine. I was, you know, you remind me so much of uh, me. I was exactly like you, right? Um, your first finger is on an F, okay? Now, how many times have you practiced the shift from an A to an F? Mm. Not much. Aha, uh -huh. okay. So can we try that? Just like we were doing before, you see how we were doing the long bows in the scale and we were taking our time and we were paying attention to our arm? Can we do the same thing, except this time, to play the notes A and then we're going to shift to the F. Now, there's something important that you have to know about when you're shifting up. When you shift up the violin, you must shift up and around the instrument. So what I mean is you cannot go straight from this A to this F because your hand will essentially get stuck here, right? And this will not give you much flexibility to be able to do anything. I mean, it's really hard to vibrate here because you're basically just running your hand into the violin. So when you shift, you want to make sure that you go around the instrument. And that happens two ways. If you think about your elbow coming around the violin, and then you think about your thumb going around and hitting the basically the button of the neck. Yeah? Can you try it super slow for me once? Just like you were doing in the two notes in the scale. Can you start down bow? Sorry. No. I want you to go. Yes, now here's the thing that I want you to pay attention to. I want you to go embarrassingly slow, right? Now, I, I want you to basically, and like you're playing this in concert right now, 
and you're you're playing it at the slowest speed that you ever have and you feel like wow this is uncomfortably slow can you play it that slow for me okay good that's a little bit better now what i want you to do is when you put down the finger initially on the note. Then you keep the bow moving, but the first finger is hovering above the string. Do you hear that? It's it's like ghosts. It's like a ghost town, right? That's why I tell my students it's like Ghostville, right? So if you can hear that, you get to the... I, I hear it before I put my finger down, and then I put my finger down, and then I play the note. Can you try that? And I want you to do it painfully slow, like so slow. <laughs> That's okay, it's actually not bad. Here's what I want you to do. I want you to play the note and then immediately let go. Then while you're still on the down bow, travel up. See if you can hear it before you go up bow. Put your finger down and then play the up bow. Can you try it? Yes. Ollie, was that painfully slow? Yes. Really? I think you could make it more painful for all of us. Like make us make us wait forever. Right? So I want it to be like this slow. Was that painfully slow for you? Yeah, yeah me too. <laughs> Can you show me? Yes, that is awesome. So that's step one, right? So there's three steps in this shift and I'm just gonna go over them really quick and move on to the next thing because I don't know how much time I have. So I'm gonna go fast, I'm gonna go fast. Okay, so this is step one to practicing this, right? This is part of that um, intonation component which makes a great violinist. So the three things that we look for in being a great violinist is we first wanna really get a beautiful sound we then want to try and play in tune as well as we can. But the important thing, which is always, always overlooked, is having really great internal pulse, which is great internal rhythm. And that I don't know why that's overlooked so often, but that is something that is so important in violin playing. Okay? But this is going to a component. So you did the first step. Then the second step is doing the same shift, playing the F, then putting the third finger down and playing the A. Can you try that? Good, so in you have to think the first note that you play is an A, and that note that you end up on is an A. They have to be the same A. They don't sound the same, so you have to be aware of that when you're playing it, okay? But that is the second step. Then the third step is like you're shifting still to the F, but you don't play it, and then the only note that you play is the A. So you shift, then put down the third finger, and only that so you go a to that a but do it painfully slow that's it that's on intonation okay so realizing that there is a guide to where you're going and identifying how you're getting there and what you're doing to do that Okay, then the last thing I'm going to say, and even need to demonstrate it. 
the last thing I'm going to ask you is how many times have you practiced this through with a metronome on one tempo? None. Exactly. That's, <laughs> that, is, that is the internal pulse component. So you have to be able to play all of it through solid in one tempo without adjusting because of the technical components. Then once you do that, you gradually speed it up to the tempo that you want. And then you start to feel it internally. And then you start to have this sense of ease and steadiness inside. And that helps you do everything that you're trying to do musically. So these three components are going to totally get you having these pieces completed even quicker. But they're also going to have you thinking about the things that you constantly need to develop further in your uh, musical career. Does that make sense? Yeah. You're awesome. I'm wishing you all the best and so much success, but try these things and see if they help, okay? Yeah. Fantastic. Thank you so much. Hey, Ollie, one thing before you disappear, which is I just have to say that I really loved your the sense of dance that you had in the in your in your performance. And I think that these things that Pasha is saying for practicing will just help that come out even more. So you have the really crazy melodic stuff at the beginning and then the dancing stuff at the end, and it'll just really come together amazingly well. Thank you so much for participating and for playing for us tonight. Thank you. Yay, Ali! So I think Wendy is ready to play for us. We're going to share her video of the Sibelius uh, first movement. And Wendy, what section did you put on your video? Can you just tell everyone how much of it there will be? Um, the first two pages and then the cadenza. Perfect. Thank you. It's a, uh, we can't unfortunately share the whole movement because it's what about 15 minutes long, <laughs> but, um, but this is, this is highlights. So here is uh, Wendy's video.
Hey. <laughs> Brava. Thank you. Hey, Wendy, can you tell me how long you've been working on this piece? Um, about four months, like on and off. Four months. Okay. And how old are you? I'm 17. 17. Okay. Does that mean you're still in high school? I don't know. Yeah, I'm in my last year. In you're in your last year. Okay. Are, are you auditioning for music schools this next year? Yeah. Oh, ah, <laughs> yeah. So you uh doing Sibelius yeah I've got offers um I've done auditions oh you're done okay fantastic great okay um okay I'm just gonna I'm not gonna go through the entire thing I'm gonna tell you a couple things that I think that you can really hone in on that I feel like would just um maybe elevate it a little bit more um in terms of what you're trying to do because I see what you're trying to do musically I think that this will maybe help it come across a little bit more smooth, like a little bit more connected to the audience wise, right? Um, okay, the two main things that I noticed when I listened to this, and I really, Cecily sent me these videos yesterday, and I really tried not to listen to them until late because, you know, when you listen to something, being violinists, of course, we like think about it, and then we think of and then we overanalyze it and then we overanalyze it and then we rethink about it and then you overanalyze it so it becomes like a, a vicious cycle because like you're like telling yourself something and then you're telling yourself something else and you're like wait do these make sense together and so okay here's what i think i think one of the main things that i hear in your opening is that you have a lot of banana swells do you know what i mean by that it's like a it's like a Doppler effect, you know, when you hear an ambulance go by. Yeah. Like, da, 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 Whenever you sustain a note, it's not quite sustained. So you don't actually hold the sound. You tend to release and then add speed at the end, which creates this wave of sound that's like coming in and out. Yeah. Have you heard that before? Uh yeah. Oh, yeah, really okay, so, so the question is, how do you work on that? Um, just Because it's one thing to hear it, right? But then it's another thing to like actually practice trying to break the habit. Um, I could try to crescendo. Okay. Is there anything that you do in your basic technical practice that helps you kind of alleviate that sort of Doppler effect? Um, playing maybe open strings and just trying to sustain. Okay. Do you do you do you do that? Yeah, sometimes. And then do you do it for so? Okay, what you're giving me is a good answer, but I want it more specific. I feel like that's a very broad answer. Like, I just open strings and then I just try to sustain the sound. I feel like that's very broad, but I feel like you need to get you need to put me in the nitty gritty. Like, make it really really specific so that I understand exactly how you would practice it and what you would do every day to alleviate that. I think I tend to um, do crescendo at the tip. Yeah. So if I um, practice for long notes and then when I do get to the tip, I can try to crescendo through. Mm -hmm. So here's what I'm specific sort of thing, right? So something that I would do is I would say, okay, I have this issue where I'm you know, swelling on notes. Oh, my main goal is to sustain the sound. How am I going to sustain the sound? Well, obviously, I have to try and keep the bow speed and the bow weight as consistent as I possibly can with my contact point. Okay, how am I going to do that? These notes in the Sibelius are longer than two beats, longer than three beats. Some of them are longer than four beats. What am I going to do? I'm going to put on the metronome. I'm going to put it at quarter note equals 60, and I'm going to draw the bow for four beats, and I'm going to try and keep the sound as sustained as I possibly can, 
both down and up. Then I'm going to try and do six beats on each bow. Then I'm going to do eight on each bow. And then I'm going to do 12 beats on each bow. So that, and this is a process, right? Obviously, the first time you do it, it won't feel great. The second time you do it, it won't feel great. The first week you do it, it won't feel great. But the goal is over time that it starts to feel more natural and more comfortable, right? And then that technical skill can then be transferred into what you are trying to do musically in your pieces. Sense. Wendy? Yep. That makes sense? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> I didn't catch the end. Yeah. Sorry. I forget. Sometimes I just like ask questions and they don't sound like questions. They sound like I'm answering myself, but yes. Yeah. Um, so that's something that I want you to practice. So um, can we try it? Can we just try it once? Do you have a metronome nearby? I know it's going to sound annoying to some of us, but I think it might be good. 60. Yes. See? Should I? And then I want you to try and do, let's try four beats on each bow. And why don't you just do open A? a question for you when you're doing this where do you feel like you're moving your arm from um, can I try again yeah absolutely like here okay can you try something for me can you think about your elbow? And when you bow, can you think about bowing out with your elbow? You actually do quite a good job with it until the end of the bow. Then you tend to cut it like this. Can you try and keep it super consistent all the way out and in with the elbow? Fantastic. Now I'm, I'm hearing a really great start of the sound at the very beginning. And then as you're getting towards the tip, I feel like you're losing the sound. So how can we fix that? Um, do I run out of bow at the end? Or... Say that one more time. Is it that I run out of bow at the end? No, it's not. Maybe just more arm weight. Hmm, that could be a little part of it, but there's something else that you're missing. Um, okay, but yeah. Like, um, yeah. Do you want? Do you want me to help? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I think something that you can really focus on is the momentum of the bow. Because I feel like actually once you get, once you're going towards the tip, you lose momentum and then things kind of relax, but they can't relax. They have to stay sustained all the way through so that the sound is as even as you can possibly make it. Does that make sense? So see if you're, when you're going towards the tip, if you can keep the momentum of your arm continuous and think about the sound as spinning circular right so it's constantly spinning like this spin 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 good it's better when you get towards the frog your fingers are quite they're quite loose I'm wondering, actually, if you can hold the bow a little bit more 
and feel the change a little bit more with your entire arm rather than letting your fingers end up becoming so loose and then they're like moving like this, right? Can you, can you hold a little bit more in your hand? So there is a difference between holding and squeezing, right? So just feel the hold, but don't squeeze. Better. And when you turn around, use your arm. Use the arm to turn it around also. Good. Now, I want you to keep following through, but your shoulder is going up a little bit. It's going... Can you keep it down? Better. So this is something that you can practice, right? And every time, put on the metronome, do four beats, six beats, eight beats, and 12 beats to the bow until it feels like you're sustaining. Now, a way that you can easily identify this in Sibelius is when you're practicing the opening, take out all of the vibrato and solely focus on the sound and the consistency of sound. Can you try that? Just the, Oh, just one other thing on a random side note. How many times have you practiced this with a metronome? Uh, at the beginning. But, but not for a while, right? Uh, yeah. So I know I keep coming back to the same basic information, but these things are so crucially important because when I was listening to your uh, video, I was going... Da -da 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 and you were not lining up. So that is something that you really have to pay attention to, right? That's that internal pulse that puts us more at ease when we play things like this. If we feel the, if we feel the rhythm and we feel the beat, then we actually calm down quite a bit. It's when we don't, we start to feel unstable and like things are kind of more out of our control. Does that make sense? So I think that's something that you can really focus on. It's like try to practice that with the metronome. Try practicing it all in one speed and see if you can start to internalize that rhythm. Yeah? Okay, but let's try the beginning. No vibrato, just focus on the sustained sound. Cecily, you'll stop me when you need to, right? Okay, great. Okay, do me a favor. Can you turn on the metronome? I'm sorry. I'm a terrible human being. I know. Maybe like... Da, da, da. Maybe a hair slower. Da, 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 da. Great. Try it there. Notice how your bow distribution is kind of not planned out, which is what is causing a lot of the swelling. Because you'll speed through, so if you hear it, you're going through, and then you play. And you'll speed through, right? So you have to be able to sustain same sound, same weight, everything consistent, consistent as you possibly can make it. 
so that we don't hear any of this jerking. Can you try it one more time? See if you can really be, pay attention to that. Is it um, almost time, Cecily? Is that what you're giving me? Okay, let's try it one more time. Bravo, better, better. So that's the sort of thing that you can concentrate on, right? Now, the last thing I want to tell you is please do not be one of these artists. And I've heard this from people who have taught me, they call them YouTube artists, right? Which is, which means this, a lot of us hear, you know, recordings of Sibelius and we hear the opening and there's like no vibrato and it's like, they, they say they see the landscape like that. And it's like, he wrote Mezzo Forte Dolce Espressivo. Okay, like, how, how icy can it possibly be, right? And then, like, you see things at the bottom of the first page when you da 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 and it's written veloce, right? Which actually means rapid. It doesn't mean work your way into the tempo. And then you get to the top, ya da 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 to the E flat, and people take their bow off, even though there's no rest written. You see what I'm saying? There's like basic things that we all do because we've heard it that way. And so we think that that's artistically how it needs to sound. I just challenge you to do what's on the page first. And then if you hate what's on the page and you want to do, you want to do something artistically a little bit different, then you can explore it. But until you can do literally everything on the page, which means when you get to the tops of runs, how he always writes a diminuendo, every violinist always crescendos through them. It drives me crazy. Don't do it. Refrain from doing that and try it first like that and see if that helps you with your musical decisions. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Okay. You're welcome. Great. That was really beautiful. And your, your performance throughout was really beautiful, Wendy. Great job. And have you decided where you're going? Um, yeah, Cambridge. You're going to Cambridge. Well, oh. congratulations on, um, hopefully by, se by September, we'll, uh, all be back in school. <laughs> 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 Great. So, um, it is nearing eight o'clock, which is the time that, uh, here in the UK people, uh, go out on their, on their sidewalks and, and stoops and, and clap for the NHS. And there's been a bit of a tradition starting where people play somewhere over the rainbow. And I did a deep dive into YouTube myself the past couple of days, and I found a video of Pasha that- um, It's really terrible. It's you're, so You're beautiful. just so bad at this. So we're gonna share this. Um, if you wanna step out and do your thing now, please do. But in the meantime, um, we're gonna take a couple minutes and just enjoy this this little performance. This is from quite a while ago, so um, we'll share that now.
<laughs> Can I look? Good luck. Okay. Thank you. So I think we're ready for Leslie's performance. Is she here? I'm sure she is. There she is, Leslie. So Leslie's here um, with us from Toronto. And um, although she goes to school in Texas, but not in Austin, right? Where are you in school? Uh, Rice, Houston. In Houston. So um, she's going to play a Paganini Caprice for us. So this is uh, Caprice number 22. Leslie, how long have you been working on this? Oops. Sorry, I think it was, am I muted? No, I'm not. Okay. <laughs> um, I've been working on it for a month. A month. Okay. So I will be honest. When Cecily told me you were playing Paganini 22nd Caprice, I was like, which one is that? <laughs> because I have never played Paganini 22nd Caprice, nor have I ever heard it live. It's, it's just strange. Like, it's like one of those caprices that I had never heard. So I have yesterday because I wanted to actually kind of pretend like what I was talking about, but not really. So I have some thoughts for you and some ideas that may will help. Um, do you mean at the very beginning and the beginning of the minor section to have different tempos? Is that intentional? Yes, it was intentional, but it could also be something that I could not do. <laughs> no, I mean, here, so here's what I think about the very opening. I, first of all, some great things happening already that I just think you, you're coming along quite. Um, I feel like the opening you're taking really in. Do you feel like you're really taking it in six eight? Sorry, I, what did you say? 
So I feel like in the opening, you're laying it in. Is that is that accurate? Um, I I'm playing it sustained. No, in in the meter six eight. Oh, six eight. Uh, yes, yes. I I guess so. Yeah. I think it can actually have a feeling of more of a two. So yum bum 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 yum bum 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 bum. Because I feel like, you know, even though you're playing all of the notes, you're doing a job of that, you're worried about playing all the notes and you're not thinking about the line. So I think the, the musical gestures are suffering a little bit because you're being so careful with the left and the right hand. I could be wrong. No, you're right. <laughs> okay, okay. So I'm wondering if we can try that in the opening and before we add um, the note, can you do it on open strings? So the, the open strings that you would play on, just to feel it. Leslie. So you would imagine that you're always going to that last bar, right? Yum, bum, 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 right? So here's the thing that you have to ask yourself. If you use the same amount of bow on every note that is in the slur, how will the audience know that you're actually arriving somewhere? True. <laughs> <laughs> right? And then at the very opening, you do beautiful, uh, uh, like a, a sound at the beginning of the down bows, dum, bum, but we actually lose it on the up bows. So we need the same, you need to uh, have a little bit more, more momentum at the beginning of your up bows so that we hear that same articulation in the sound. Can you add, can you add the left hand and try it? Good. So I can tell that the double stop that you're worried about is the first double stop of the fourth bar. Right? You feel uncomfortable going to that, right? So how have you practiced that to get rid of the uncomfortableness? Um, I guess I should be practicing the shift. Um, okay. With the um, I haven't really practiced it like that, but I probably should. <laughs> <laughs> so see, because you haven't done that yet, you're hindering your your own musical expression on what you're trying to do, right? Because in your mind, you're singing it probably exactly how I'm singing it. Yum, bum, 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 bum. But you're stopping yourself from fully committing to the idea because you haven't worked out the technical component of it yet. Yeah. Do you see what I'm saying? So that's something that you can address and it will all of a sudden change the way that we hear it musically. Right? Now, my other question is, the first two bars, dum, bum, are you wanting them to be lyrical or more militant in sound? I was thinking like kind of triumphant. Fantastic. And then the slurs, are you trying to have those more lyrical? Okay, then you need to commit a little bit more to both of those ideas. Okay. So when you're really trying to make it lyrical, can you really sustain with the bow? Ever so slightly, just letting a little bit in between each note. And then with the triumphant sound, can you think about the bow speed and the bow weight in a way that will make it pop? Which is, you're probably going to have to give a little bit more on the front ends of the notes. Okay. Can you try that? Yes, and instead of diminuendoing into that last thing, yum, bum, 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 can you lean into it? Yes. 
Because what happens is when we feel uncomfortable, we back away, right? We're like, oh, no, I don't want to do that, right? But the beautiful thing about playing violin is we're not heart surgeons. So if we mess up, nobody, right? Every, everybody will live. Everything will be fine. Mistakes, who cares? They happen totally fine, right? So can you just lean into it? Can you try one more time? Good, and on that, that was so good. Then when you get to the second phrase, bom, 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 bom. Can you actually give more from the leap up? Bom, 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 bom. Yes, but don't, no, it's okay. Don't let the double stops hinder what you're trying to do musically. Just do what you're trying to do musically and then we can always fix the technique. Yeah, so the thing that you always have to remember is the technique is there to serve the musical idea. It's never the other way around, right? Music does not serve technique. Technique serves the music. So as long as you have a clear idea of where you want your phrases to go and how you want them to be delivered, then you figure out technically how to achieve it. It's not like, oh, I learn all of the notes, I play all of the rhythm, and now I can be musical. You know, it, it, it doesn't work like that, right? Yeah. So you have to remember being a musician first. Technique serves being a musician, right? Then whatever's not working, we isolate those things and then we get them to work, okay? When you do the three note chords, oh, um, when you do the three note chords, the thing that I hear is not enough clarity on the chords. So, can you do me a favor? Bar 21, your music. That's um, bum, 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 bum. Yeah. yeah. Can you try that slowly once? Can you do those all down bow? Slowly, like all super slow. All the chords down bow. Okay. Do you want it from. Uh, no, after that. Okay. So it's the one that's. Uh, uh, do you know what I'm talking about? Yeah. Okay. Good. Can you try it again one more time? Even slower. So, yum. And as you're circling, set your left hand. Circle, set left hand. Circle, set left hand. Okay, so here's the thing that's happening technically is that you're actually circling faster than you're drawing the bow. But what I want you to do is keep the bow circle. So if I'm going same speed, and then I set hand. Do you see what I'm saying? So set hand, but the bow speed stays the same. I don't go, uh, and then go, er, right? Circle at the same speed. Hear how clear it is? Hear how we could hear when you were playing the uh, F, F natural, D, and B flat that the F natural was out of tune? Yes. <laughs> right? Because we could actually hear it this time. Like, clarity is super important, right? And so this is also giving your left hand a chance to set. But then, as you're doing this down bow, down bow, down bow, down bow, then you realize, you're like, oh my gosh, I have to have the same sound if I'm doing down bow, up bow, down bow, up bow. And then that's what you get into your ear. And then you try and achieve that with that bowing, right? So try it one more time, all down bows. 
And then we'll try and go back and try and incorporate the bowing that you are doing. Same speed? Same speed. Fantastic. Now, the last thing I want you to pay attention to is every time you play a chord, you dip. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> right? See if you can keep the plane of your violin the same and just let your right arm do the work. Don't let this hinder what's going on here. How does that feel? It feels very like we're giving a lot of clarity to the chords. Yeah. And I think that's what you're trying to do anyways, right? Yes. Fantastic. So then thinking about that, right? And then listening for that and then trying to achieve it. Now, let's try and do the bowing that you want to be doing, which is down up. Same, but when you get some of the down bow, you're going to have to set your hand quickly and then keep your bow like this and then put it in. You see what I'm saying? So suspend, keep it, keep it moving even at the bottom when you're going back up. Hear how beautifully clear it is? I hear every chord. Do you hear every chord? Yes. Fantastic. But did you realize that when you played it the first time, it sounded like kind of like chompy, like right? And so then you have to figure out, okay, then how can I get it a little bit faster and still keep the same clarity? And then you're going to achieve that. Yeah. Um, I think still having a little bit of space in between the notes to set the hand okay. and also keeping the bow moving um, will still apply, but just using less bow in general, not the full bow. Um, and then also maybe um, a faster bow speed um, to launch the chords. Here's what I think. I actually feel like at the front end of the, of the chord, the bow speed should be slower. Okay. And then on the back end of the chord, it should have a little bit of speed because it will it will create some brilliance in the sound. Okay. Can you can you try and reverse the way you're thinking about it? Yeah. Can you try it once? Just use use the amount of bow that you would normally use and maybe just a hair faster. So ba yum ba yum ba yum Good. Now use a lot less bow. A little bit faster. Like a third of the bow only. Only a third of the bow. Yeah. Is it better? Yeah, I think it is. <laughs> <laughs> Can it get even better? Yes, definitely. Okay, so let's try a hair faster. Yum, bum, bum, yum, bum. That that speed. So what happened here is you actually tightened in your right hand, and then we got more crunch. Did you hear it? Did you hear how it wasn't as clear? Yeah. You're aiming. For that you have longer ones. Aim for the same clarity.
it's better. Try it one more time. See if you can have a, your left hand set a little bit sooner. I, I know, I'm sorry for the people that are watching this. I know that this seems kind of psycho <laughs> because it's like redundant over and over again. But what I found in my teaching is that um, this is how my students progress the quickest is when I kind of drill these things home and then they have concepts to apply of the piece. Um, and that way I can spend time on smaller chunks and make it as efficient as I possibly can. And then I point to every spot in the piece that is identical and I say, apply it here, apply it here, apply it here. And then I want to hear all of those sections back to back at your next lesson. Seems that they like move through it a little bit quicker if I do it this way than if I just go through every single spot over and over and over again. So I, I'm sorry, but I promise it works. <laughs> okay, try it. <laughs> Good, try it a little bit quicker. Clarity is better. I mean, doesn't it sound so much more clear? Yeah. And doesn't it make you feel good? It makes me feel good. <laughs> Definitely. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so let's try, oh, one other spot I wanna talk to you about. You know, when you're going up the tenths yeah. and you're going to that top B flat in D, Here's a trick to make it sound virtuoso. If you actually speed through the easier ones, like you actually go a little bit faster, and then as you get to the top ones, take more time, it will be considered virtuosic. Okay. <laughs> right? Because people are like, oh my gosh, she's so good. Did you hear how great she was just whipping off those tents? Then they don't even pay attention that in the ones that are the hardest, you're actually taking a little bit more time to get to them. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I'm a terrible human being. I know it. I know it. I'm so sorry. But that's really that's really a musical gesture and really a way that you can create this uh, sense of musicality throughout, right? So do you want to try that once? Okay. Yeah, and I want you to really use a lot more bow when you get to the top. Yum, ba, ba, ya, da, da. And then can you actually more on the string and a little bit more um, legato surprise? Ba, 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 ya. Okay. Can you try that? Is it okay to start from the beginning of the tense or do you want it from? Absolutely. No, no, no. You can totally do it. Yeah, yeah. Okay, sorry. I let I don't stop you, but here's another thing. When you go yum bum 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 bum, we understand that you're gonna do the same thing on the next one. Do you see what I'm saying? Yeah. So you have to make a conscious decision. If you're gonna take time on the first note of the first bar, then you don't take time on the next one, right? You do something different, and then if you want to take time again, third, you can or do something different. But the whole thing is to not make it sound redundant, because if you do that, then it sounds more like an etude and not a composition, yeah. right? Like like an actual work. And we need it to sound like a work, right? right? So choose your battle of which one you want to actually take time on, and then which ones you don't. Okay. Okay. Oh my gosh, sounds so musical. I like that. Do you like that? Yes, thank you. 
<laughs> and I think, you know what I think about the last bar? I think when you do, ya da 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 yum, I want this to actually be short and cute. Yum, bum, 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 Instead of, yum, bum, 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 you just came from lyrical. If you, if you do the next bar lyrical, then I feel like it kind of defeats the, the like, you know, difference of the line. You know what yeah. I'm saying? Yeah. So can you try that? more time and just think about that and make it short at the end like yum bum 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 okay I think there could still be more contrast. Also, when you think about these sequences, yum bum 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 Each one needs to be a little bit more, right? Really lead me. Lead me there. Don't be shy. Lead me there. Okay. Okay. Beautiful. And then then you hear the things that are like not quite working technically and you're like, okay, so clearly I need to fix the intonation here or I need to fix how my left hand is being set. But at least you're from a place of music and not from a place of tech component. Okay. Right? Yeah. Your technique serves the music. It doesn't go the other way. And you always have to have that as the thing that's first and foremost in your mind when you're doing stuff like this. Brava. Thank you. <laughs> Amazing. So we have one more performer tonight. Louisa, are you there? Louisa studies with me at the Northern. She's going to play some of Sasson's third concerto, the first movement. And it's a pretty short section, actually, so we have lots of time to work on it and she needs to appear in my where are you louisa she's warming up there she i see her i see her good there <laughs> she is okay excellent so um here is the sasson <laughs>
Hey, brava! I really do love these virtual claps so much. <laughs> love them. I really do. Hey, Louisa, that sounds great. Thanks. How long? How long have you been working on this? Um, I think a couple months or so, maybe a bit more. Oh, a couple no. months. Okay. Okay. So I'm gonna show you guys how. Well, I think I've been showing them how like all of this information just ties into every single person. How when we talk about like, you know, beautiful sound and then in tune and then great internal pulse, like all, all tie in. Louisa, can I ask you, do you practice this with a metronome? Um, no, I don't think I have. <laughs> I just love it so much because it just makes me feel like I'm at students. I just, even virtually, ah. Uh, it just gives me that sense of warmth, you know, because the thing is, I think that that has to be ground zero, right? It's like, can you play it through in one tempo without stopping, you know, because the thing is, when we don't have a pianist or if we're not playing with an orchestra or we don't have anybody to keep us accountable and pulse, can we keep ourselves accountable, right? And the way to do that is to initially practice it with that is keeping us accountable and then trying to do it without that keeping us accountable to see if we can really feel it. You know what I mean by that? Because like the thing is, it's like, okay, you practice a concerto forever and forever and forever. Then you go to your first rehearsal with the pianist and everything feels like so different. You're like, oh my gosh, I'm so sorry. I could play that run like two days ago. Like, I don't, I don't know what's happening right now. And it's because too, you were taking whatever tempo you wanted and it felt great. And now somebody is holding you accountable to playing at a specific tempo. And you're like, oh, uh, uh, you're, you're just not, not comfortable with that. So then all of a sudden our bodies react differently because we haven't trained our hands how that feels in that moment at that speed stay does that make sense yeah okay so that's something that i want to pay attention to and then the other thing is if you're a student okay do you have a goal tempo do you have a goal metronomic marking um i forgot off the top of my head but it kind of uh 90 maybe something around there okay. uh no maybe so, no. no, 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 it's okay. Don't worry. Here's the thing. This is, this is all, this is, this is all students. They're, they're, you know, and this is how I was too. We're very kind of like vague, you know, we're like, uh, yeah, I mean, 86. Actually, I and think it was like, much lower than what's written. I was thinking <laughs> yes, like it, 72. It is. Yes, it is, it is. So here's the thing. If you have a goal tempo written, how do you know what you're striving to do? So what was the last bit, sorry? How do you know what you're striving to do if you don't have a final goal? If you yeah. don't have a destination, what are you training for? You know what I'm saying? It's like running a marathon, but not knowing that the marathon is, you know, X amount of miles. But you're gonna, yeah. you're gonna run one, you just don't know when you're gonna get to the finish line. Yeah. Do you know what I'm saying? Yeah. So this, this is the part of being a student that is difficult. It's not like professional life. Because in professional life, you don't learn your part to the standard, you get fired. You know, and then you're like, oh, I guess I'm out of a job. Cool. <laughs> you know? When you're a student, this is when you train yourself to get into that mode so that nothing surprises you when you are at that place in your life. Does that make sense? Yeah. Be really diligent about that. And even in this time of quarantine, right? Set a destination for yourself. I want to have the first movement done on this date. Okay, you set the date, work your way backwards. Where do you need to be a week before that? Where do you need to be 10 days before that? Where do you need to be two weeks before that? And then 
you have a clear-cut plan of how to get there, and you have a goal so that you don't feel like you're stagnant, right? And that you're like not doing anything or you want to practice, but what are you practicing for? And I mean, you're stuck in your place, so you might as well watch Netflix and hang out. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. I mean, we all do it. We're, we're all guilty. All musicians are guilty, 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 right? But the thing is, you're, 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 in, a, you're in the prime time of your life where you can really start to take advantage of this so that you set yourself up to be successful when you're out of school, because that is the ultimate goal, right? Yeah. Cecily's going to push you and push you and push you because she knows like what it takes to get to where she is and how she got there. So she's going to push you in that direction, but then the rest of it come from you and the initiative that you take and the responsibility that you own to make sure that when you get there, there's nothing left to chance. You own it. Does that help? Or is yeah. that just like a bad lecture? That's a terrible No, that's lecture, really helpful. That's really interesting. <laughs> okay, so with that being said, that should be your homework this week, right? Find the tempo that you wanted to ultimately be at and work your way backwards. Yeah. Give yourself a deadline because that's the other thing. In school, while you're old, this is the time for you to learn as much repertoire as you possibly can. If you are only learning like one concerto a semester, right? And let's just say there's two semesters in a school year. That means when you're done with your undergrad, you will have only learned eight concertos. I can guarantee you that there are way more than eight concertos in the violin repertoire. And depending on where you start will be where you end up, right? So you might not even start at like you know, the Glazunov, Prokofiev one, Prokofiev two. Like you might be starting from Sessons three, right? And then, or Mendelssohn or Lalo. And then you have to work your way up through these, right? So you have to, have to set these goals for yourself so that at the end you've accomplished what you need to so that your technical skills are set and you feel confident and comfortable in your playing. That's what the goal is. Okay. Yeah. Okay. With that being said, let's work on the beginning. So what, what is what sort of, um, what is this sort of character that you're trying to achieve in the opening? What, what are you trying to give me as an, as a listener? Um, I think it's like a really strong, um, monologue of perhaps like this big man and he's on a stage alone and, um, he's killed someone. <laughs> That's what I think of. That's pretty, pretty like great imagination actually. <laughs> so I, I appreciate that. How are you going to do that in the technical components? What are you going to do? Um, think of what are you going to use? Are you going to use like two inches of bow? No, as much. No, as, <laughs> as much. Did you feel like you were doing that? No. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And then, so if you're going to use as much bow as possible, what else is written on those notes? What else do we have? Accents. Accents. So even, even more impactful, right? Mm -hmm. Is there anything else written there? Um, and then like, on some of them that are not accents, the carrots or like hats. But is there, is there anything, are there any words written, anything? Appassionato. What does that mean? Um, with passion. Okay, so like, this man that's doing this monologue is clearly very passionate about maybe the, the killing of somebody, I don't know, <laughs> something like that, right? So then you have to think, how am I going to bring this across in my playing? Something that one of my teachers always told me is that you need to feel like there's um, ice in your veins and fire in your hands. Okay. And I think that's something that could probably work in the opening of this. So you need to basically feel cool, calm, collected on the inside, but you need to feel the heat in the hands, right? Yeah. So you need to produce energy with the bow. And you need to produce energy with the vibrato and the intensity behind the left hand. I think that will give you that this character that you're aiming for. Can you try that in the opening and see if that helps? 
Okay, when you do ba uh ya ya da 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 so the eighth notes do they have accents? Um no. Do the quarter notes have accents? Oh sorry. Uh, oh I'm sorry, I forgot. I, I, I don't know the accents. Yeah, sorry. Cecily told me to brush brush up on the crotchets and the is it the quavers, semi quavers? Sorry, I should know. The quarter notes have accents. Yes. Right, Thank you. So, I'm so sorry. She warned. She warned me too. She warned me, and I still didn't do it. Ah. Um, it's fine. Okay. I should be used to it by now. <laughs> so, can you give me more on those notes, and then also? In the very beginning, can you slow down? Can you go ya da 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 ya da 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 ya da ya? I actually feel like your um, notes are too quick for them to give the impact in the way that you're trying to give them. Give yourself a little bit more time to give this sort of intensity behind the sound. <laughs> Hey, brava! Better. How did that feel? Um, a little bit less out in control, but I liked it. Yeah, it helps with the speed being slower. I think. Okay, so then he do to create musical contour. So beginning. Ya da ya da ya, ba da 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 ya. Every time we have smaller rhythmic values, we push a little bit. Ya ya da 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 da. Ba ba ba. Can you try that? Give it direction to the bottom. Wow, how did that, how did that feel? I didn't do exactly what you said, but I think I get you. Actually, actually, I think it's good. <laughs> <laughs> I think you could have a little bit more direction on the ya, ya, da, 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 da. But the first one, yeah, da, 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 it was really nice. Okay. So now try it and try and feel super wild when you do it. Just let go. Don't try and like hold the suspense in your body. Try and be free and be wild with it. Just let it go. <laughs> Oh, oh, that was nice. Look at you, musician and all. How did that feel? Yeah, that felt much, yeah, more direction. Right? Yeah. And all we did was organize your thoughts a little bit more. Not like we're like implementing a ton of new things. We're just taking your ideas. We're organizing them in a way so that you understand musically what you're trying to achieve, and then you're figuring out the technical component to achieve them. Yeah. Right? Yeah. I think that's the main thing that you have to be consistently thinking about is like the organization of thoughts and then how you can execute them. Yeah. Okay, so let's try it and let's keep going a little bit. From the beginning. Now, oh, yeah, do it again. Now, when you get to the top D, yada, yada, ya, yada, da, 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 can you take more time at the top? You're going to have to actually use a lot more bow weight at that top D. You're going to have to really, oh, this was the other thing I was going to tell you. 
I, I meant to say this to Wendy also. Wendy, hi. Um, so when you're on the G string, you guys, sometimes your elbow is too low. So you're trying to push this, you're like, like really pressing. Get your elbow up. And for the string, there are three sides to each. There's a left side and there's a right side, right? For the G string, when you're trying to get the, the fat sound, like that juice behind the sound, you need to aim for the left side of the string. So that your arm is basically coming from above, right? So you have this motion of your arm being above the string, and then you're pulling from pulling and pushing at that angle, right? Yeah. Does that make sense? So when yeah. you start, don't let your arm be too low because this won't give you the sound. This will give you the sound, right? You just want to make sure that this shoulder is loose when you're doing it. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Let's try it. Lisa, that was good. Okay. How did that feel? Um, I didn't enjoy that top D, but I could work yeah. that. Do you, you know why you didn't enjoy that top D? I didn't get round enough. No, that's not why you didn't uh, enjoy it. Uh, I didn't think of it. I didn't, yeah, before I played it, I didn't think of it. No. In a positive way. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. That's also not it. Sorry? <laughs> That's also not it. Okay. She's like, do you want to tell me what it is? Yeah. <laughs> so the thing is, you're shying away from it. You're not yeah. really... So the note before, when you get to that B, you're not keeping the weight of the bow in the string. You're letting go. And then you're trying to go up but you're not keeping the weight of the bow in the string, so you're not fully committing to what you're doing. Yeah. You have to commit from this B all the way up to the D. Can you try just play the B and play the D and sustain the sound and keep the weight of the bow? Yes, again, and keep your violin up. Really let the arm be above the string. Give it that full sound. <laughs> Start to move fast. So when you go, you see, so you don't go up and around. Yeah.
hear Pasha at all. Uh, Louisa, can you try it again? Oh, it came back? Uh-oh, now I can't hear Louisa. Are you on mute? Oh, Louisa, you're on mute. Can you unmute yourself? Oh, there we go. That's the idea. So you get that. And you have to slow down your bow when you get to the D and add more weight than what you're adding right Shall I play from the beginning? I can hear you now. I think we've maybe perhaps tested Zoom to its limit tonight, and we should uh, take it to some questions and answers. Type in the chat if you have questions. That'll be easiest right now. Louisa, that sounds fantastic, and I'm sorry for the technical whatever. It's kind of amazing that in uh, four sessions, this is the first problem we've had, and I'm not sure why. We'll never know, but that sounded great. So if there are any questions, please type them into the group chat or if you're on YouTube, uh, I think we can get some questions from there too if you type in the chat there. Um, or you can raise your hand and unmute you and see and hope for the best. Maybe it's, it's had enough of violin playing for the night. So anyone? Anyone with questions? Louisa, yes. Okay, um, sorry, this is quite personal, but um, you know the, um, do you have bar numbers, Pasha? Bar, no, 98. bar 98, the Dolce Espressivo. Da, da, da. Yeah. yeah, should you, um, would you relate that to the beginning tempo completely? Um, I would probably relate it to the beginning tempo, but I would relax the feel of it. Yeah. Right? Okay. More lyrical, more melodic in that way, right? So you wanted to play a little bit more with the general pulse. You wanted to have continuity from what you initially did. Sure. Great. Thank you. <laughs> I'm worried for a moment 
there when she said it was a personal question. Personal to Louisa. Uh, anyone else? Any questions? No one from YouTube is popping in. Pasha, you, you said to me in advance that you'd be happy to talk about um, the audition process and things like that in the States. Is there anything that you just want to, to spout off about before we call it a night? So I just had a student that just actually did her her college auditions this year for her undergrad. And I think there are, are a few things that to think about, but I think the thing we did that worked out really well is we created a spreadsheet. Hi. <laughs> so basically what we did is we wrote up top what schools she was wanting to apply for. And then we wrote below when she needed the repertoire by, and then pieces she needed to have, right? And then on the back, we wrote all of the audition requirements for each one of the. So she applied at a Juilliard, NEC, Colburn, CIM, McDuffie, and McGill. She actually got into all six. I can't believe it. I mean, that's like, I was like, go you, you're doing great. Um, but I think one of the things that we made sure that we prepared was that we just had prepared all of the stuff so far in advance, because that's the thing that I was telling you, Lisa, right? It's, it's like, where destination? And then work your way back from the destination. And how are you going there? Right? And then once you have the the guidelines to how you want to achieve that goal, it's a lot less uh, fearful. Like we, we, we second guess ourselves a lot less because a plan of action and we can do that and we can achieve it, we know what the guidelines are, achieve it. then all we have to do is hold ourselves to the standard of getting there, right? But if we're just kind of like avoiding things and we're very vague with what we need to accomplish, then it becomes actually scary you know, because it's the unknown and the unknown is never, it never feels great, right? Spontaneity feels great in performances when you can do it, but unknown does not feel great. <laughs> that, that's, that spreadsheet fills me with joy. Um, probably not a surprise to my students. Um, Something else I was thinking about actually yesterday when I was taking my allotted one hour walk um, was the idea of preparing for uh, many things at the same time. And what you just said kind of addresses that a bit that, you know, it's, you might have this goal and then this goal and then this goal. And that doesn't mean that you only look at the first one. If you're not looking at the last one, this sort of through the first and second ones, it's much harder to get get where you're going, which I think is what you're, you're saying. Any other questions? I have a question. Sorry, I just want to say one thing really quick about that. It's like, you know, when people say that they want to play in a major orchestra, but they've never really studied with like a concert master or somebody that has done that orchestra experience their entire lives, that can be prepared so that you set yourself up for that, right? If, if, so like, if I'm wanting to work on, in my undergraduate, if I'm wanting to build my technical foundation, right, then I can go to somebody that I feel like can explain those tools and those things to me so that I can grasp them. So that if I wanted to ultimately be in a professional orchestra for my master's degree, I could go study somebody that is playing in that environment or as a concertmaster or, you know, somebody in a professional orchestra, they can guide me because my foundational skills are already set up for success. Sorry, Leslie, what were you going to say? Hi. <laughs> um, I had a question regarding um, repertoire, and um, I wondered, um, 
how do you suggest balancing learning new repertoire with um, polishing old repertoire? Like, I always find that that's a challenging balance because I have so much repertoire I want to learn, but at the same time, I also would love to spend the time honing repertoire that I want to use for like competitions or something. Um, do you have any advice for that? <laughs> I would say if you're trying to learn new repertoire, but you're trying to polish um, repertoire that you've already learned, you have to give the polished repertoire goals and deadlines. So if you're trying to do those for competitions and stuff, you have to set dates to where you would perform them or dates that you would have to have them ready by, right? And then you could work around that to figure out how much time you can allot yourself for new repertoire, right? Do you see what I'm saying? Instead of being like, I want to learn all of this, but I still need to kind of keep these things up. What are you keeping these things up for? What do you need them for? How can you work back from that and give yourself goals? And then allot the rest of the time towards the things that you want to allot it towards. Help? Yeah. I would just add to that. I, you probably wouldn't disagree. Maybe you would that um, don't underestimate the value of a very short amount of practice. So just, you know, if you're learning a new piece of music, you might, at least if, the way I work, I like to devote a big chunk of time to it. Like the new stuff, you want to spend a lot of minutes, if not hours, delving into it. The older stuff, maybe you only have seven minutes for something or two, two, you know, two very short amounts of time for it, but don't write that off as, as not being valuable because it's amazing what you can get done in, well, really in three minutes. It's amazing what you can get done in three minutes. And if you have three minutes plus three minutes plus three minutes, it's like, you know, a huge amount of work that you can do. So I think it's really easy, especially, and I'm talking to myself here, in you know these times where we're where time like what is time what you know, what are we doing with our time um because you know we don't have these tightly packed schedules full of you know i'm not on the train for three hours to do this and you know this and that it's really easy to look at a, t a amount of time and say ah uh, it's not worth it but it's always worth it like three minutes seven minutes it's always worth it and i'm gonna listen to my own advice I heard this from Cecily basically when I was like teen. So imagine that was ingrained in my head. I was like, okay, I'm going to use all the time, all the time. <laughs> Here, I'm still not taking I love her for it too. Anyone else before we uh, call it an end to this wonderful session and thank Pasha for your time and your energy and your your everything. Thank you so much for joining us. Thanks to our performers, so to Holly, for... Leslie, and Louisa, and to uh, Gemma. Is it Gemma or your teacher, Wendy, who put your name forward? Thank you very much. And to Hannah Tooley, who asked if Ollie could play. Thank you. Um, there will be more. Next week, we are with Barry Schiffman, Canadian violinist who was in the St. Lawrence Quartet for a long time and is now Associate Dean at the Glenn Gould School in Toronto. Um, he's amazing, really amazing. We have a bunch of players lined up for that. If you enjoyed this, I'm going to make my weekly, oh, there it is. Um, if you enjoyed oh, wow. this, involved, please, uh, you can send me a message, email me or contact me on Facebook if you wanna play. If you want to put someone forward to teach, I'm booked through May, but I have a feeling we'll all be here for longer than that. So um, watch this space. Um, if you are moved to send us a little bit of money so that I can pay our guest teachers, that's very welcome. We're all out of work and, um, and grateful for any support. So thank you. I'm going to say goodbye to everyone and see you next week. Bye. Thank you.